evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Dartmouth School Committee to order for Monday, November 7, 2016. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Again. Welcome to fall. Finally, I got chilly out there. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being videotaped by our own Dartmouth High School students under the supervision of Mr. Robert Variety, their television production teacher, uh, for future broadcasts on Dartmouth Community Television as well as the Dartmouth High School YouTube channel. At this time, if you have cell phones, pages, electronic devices, please silence them, put them on vibrate, and I will do the same as I'm speaking. Roll call, please. Mr. Oliver? Here. Shane Jensen? Here. Shabar? Carol Carapotis? John Newman? Yep. Well, thank you very much. I did receive, uh, just from my fellow committee members, I did receive an email from um, Dr. Carapotis stating that she did have some type of uh, medical procedure today, and uh, she was hoping that she was going to be able to get here, but unfortunately, uh, she's going to have to miss tonight's meeting. Uh, I, this time, I have not heard anything. At this time, we have allotted 10 minutes for anyone wishing to speak on any of tonight's agenda items. So if you would like to come up and voice your concern, voice your opinion, just want to talk to us about any of tonight's agenda items, I welcome you to do so at the podium. I'll take that as a no. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next up, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of the regular session minutes of October 17, 2016. So moved. Second. Motion on the floor by Mr. Noon, second by Dr. Jenkins. On the motion, any discussion? Chair sure, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you very much. Next up, I'm going to turn it over. We have a presentation uh, by the YMCA about our before and after school programs here for the Brown Public Schools. So I welcome you up to the podium. Mr. Chair, this is Samantha Houdin and Mike Mahoney from the Y. And um, I have to say before they start that uh, we've met with them a number of times uh, okay. since last year. And um, I would just like to thank them very much for their partnership with Dartmouth Public Schools. Uh, they've been nothing but cooperative and collaborative, and um, we have some new things started this year, and that's because of their efforts to, again, partner with our schools and provide some wonderful programs for a number of our schools. So we thought it'd be nice for them to come on and, and let you know what's happening at our schools. Excellent. Well, welcome. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Gifford. So we just kind of wanted to uh, take a few minutes of your time and let you know what we're doing. <coughs> Uh, in the schools and with the schools, and, and that, uh, that feeling that you have, Dr. Gifford, is uh, reciprocal. We certainly appreciate all that the school has uh, done to help us get these programs off the ground and, and make them uh, make them a reality. So uh, we're going to start uh, talking about school age in just a second. We're also going to cover some of the other things that we do with the school departments, such as the enrichment programs, the field trips, or the uh, team building stuff that we've done uh, primarily with the middle school and uh, talk about Camp Metacomet. We have about 500 kids that come to camp each year so that you all can see what we're doing there. Um, and as you look at this infographic right here, there are 709 kids that come to the Dartmouth YMCA annually. Uh, about 103 of those take part in the enrichment programs, 101 in the licensed school age program, and about 505 in our day camp. The YMCA has three areas of focus. The one that we're most concerned about tonight is youth development. And under youth development, we really focus on the social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development of all the children in our programs. So when we look at the curriculum development that we have at the YMCA, and what we're trying to instill, it really focuses around those three points. So I'll turn it over to Sam to talk a little bit about the school age program. Uh, so we do offer school-age child care at the YMCA, um, where right now we service about 79 children between our before and after school program. Um, and this fall, we started a licensed before and after school program at the Potter School, which has been going really, really well um, with the support of Mrs. Brooks and Mr. Porter um, and the great staff that they have up there. 
Um, in the morning, we start at 7 a.m. and we go right to the start of school uh, where the children have their structured opportunities for activities as well as their sort of breakfast in the school. Um, and then at the Y, we do activities with them where they can bring their own breakfast, they have homework help. Um, they can come back to us in the afternoon at Potter School, either way at the school or at the Y. That goes until 6 p.m. at both places. Um, and they participate in homework help, physical activity, we do structured activity time with them based around different content areas. Um, and we also do youth choice um, based clubs where the kids vote on what kinds of club they want. They run an eight week session. We're just wrapping up a drama club um, and an ooey gooey science club at, um, at the YMCA, which has gone really well. So we're bringing that to Potter School in the next session. Um, and Coming December 2016, we'll be opening an after-school program at the middle school. So same kind of setup that's happening at Potter and the YMCA, except at the middle school, where the kids will have use of the different areas of the middle school, the media center, different classrooms, etc. That's licensed child care. Um, we focus on He's a bad helper. <laughs> uh, we focus on three main areas uh, in licensed child care. Uh, really in all of our programs, we really focus on achievement, uh, relationship building, and belonging with our kids. We really want them to feel like they, they're they a part of something much bigger than just an after school or before school or even an enrichment program. Um, we really strive to make sure that uh, for example, when they do youth choice with the clubs, that they feel like they've accomplished something, that they were a part of, of making a really intentional decision, um, something that impacted the community. So those were just an idea for you guys to kind of see what our culture is. Uh, and then enrichment. Uh, so enrichment started long before I started at the Dartmouth Fly. Um, but these programs go right from the end of school to 5 p.m. Um, they're different um, than typical and different programs in the sense that we try to do a lot of hands-on stuff. Um, it's not as much um, kind of sitting down and just doing curriculum. It's a lot of hands-on, arts and crafts, activities, um, science projects. Um, in the past, we've run topics like model rockets, sports skills and drills, cooking with kids. We're currently running a recycled arts program, so we try to keep a broad spectrum of activities open for the kids. So Ken, that comment is actually the, uh, the precursor of the YMCA there. It really became, the YMCA really started because of Ken, that comment. As you may know, uh, the facility used to be the Children's Museum for several years, and then when it merged with the YMCA, it evolved into a day camp. So before the, the fitness equipment and the after school programming, we were primarily a day camp. So Ken, that comment has been in existence for almost 16 years now. Uh, we service about 250 to 300 kids each day. Uh, we have traditional day camps, so swim lessons, archery, uh, all kinds of uh, arts and crafts, sports, active play. We offer specialty camps, and the specialty camps revolve around anything that you can think of. Uh, but particularly this year, we're placing an emphasis on STEM or STEAM programs <coughs> with a, uh, with a connect to engineering and, and building program as well as uh, Mythbusters camps where they're going to test different theories out that you can see on the TV show. And, uh, and, and we try to uh, do a whole curriculum based on, on science, which is uh, a pretty cool thing and, and something that uh, camps are moving to across the country. WISE Nationwide serves about 1.4 million people in, after, uh, in, uh, in, in day camps. So for us, it's just a natural fit. Um, and like I said before, most of our most of the children that come to camp are from the Dartmouth Service Area, so we'll make sure they're aware of what we're doing at camp. And then lastly, we have team building and field days, and so you see a couple of pictures up there. Uh, the top picture is our 4.2 acre farm. That's a uh, 100% of the produce that's grown there gets donated back to the community, which is a uh, which is a huge benefit to all of the South Coast of Massachusetts from Fall River to Wareham. Um, and we have had several second and third grade classes from the district come out and take part in, uh, in, in helping us harvest. We've also created an education garden because we know that uh, kindergartners might not always be uh, the, the most careful when around, uh, when around plants. So we've got an area for them to, uh, to learn about agriculture as well. And it's important in this community, we're a regular <coughs> community, 
and agriculture has made up such uh, such a huge part of our history that it's a it's a great add-on or enhancement for any of the classrooms that come out because we have a curriculum developed that can uh, that can match up with the line with whatever's going on in the classroom. We also have our leadership and challenge course. So we've got eight elements where we can do some team building stuff and, and depending on uh, how, many, how many hours or how many days we have the kids out, they can progress from initiative games on ground to low ropes to high ropes. And in that picture, you see two children belayed on, a, on, a, uh, on an obstacle that's about 12 to 15 feet in the air. So a real big confidence builder. Over the past several years, we've worked with uh, Pete Rossi in the middle school to bring their eighth graders out over the course of three days to do various things. Um, anything from field games to climbing power to the obstacle course. Uh, and of course, we do that at a great discount to the school district because you guys have been so great to us as opposed to what we do. So uh, we're really excited about the partnership that we have, and we're really excited moving forward. And, uh, and anything that we can do to help enhance what's going on now, we're happy to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, cooperation and your collaboration with the uh, school system. I'll turn it over to any of my colleagues that have any thoughts or. I didn't realize that there was that much going on there, to be honest with you. I mean, right. the world was there and most of the things that we were involved with, but I didn't realize it was, it was that involved and that intense type of deal. Congratulations to Phil. Thank you. So I, I'm partial because I sit on the uh, the Y board as well, but I think it has been a real collaborative process, and I think um, Michelle's on the board as well. I know Tracy's been involved with some curriculum doing with the, with the farm, and I think it's, it's because the Y's been responsive. Some of us started out talking about the, the opportunities for middle school because we were freaked out because our kids were coming home at 2:30 in the afternoon, um, and you know who wants to have an 11 year old or a 12 year old at home all alone, super unsupervised for four hours, and so I'm really particularly thrilled to see that the middle school program is, is starting up. I think that's a real need in this community, and there's not a lot of providers, and so to have them be at their own school, because um, they're, you know, my kids, they're too cool to, to go somewhere, but being able to stay at school and, you know, access computers or the media center, that sort of thing, I think is going to be a real plus and, and help keep some of our kids engaged who um, might otherwise not be. So I'm, I'm really grateful for a great partnership. You, know, you said the, the middle school program starting in December? Starting in December, yep. Um, we've been working on that for uh, almost two years now just to get that off the ground. Um, and what I can say with regard to the middle school and to part of school is we recognize that there was a gap there, that we didn't have as many of the children coming to us because we admit that we're not in the most convenient location for parents at 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and so, uh, so there was a gap there. And there was a need that we clearly saw at Potter and that we clearly saw at the middle school. And so we're hoping to fill that need and provide quality care for those children and families. Excellent. I can never say enough about what it means to collaborate with the one uh, especially in this area. I think the South Coast Hawaii does a remarkable job. And I think the leadership that they show, um, not just in our, in our community, but in the greater South Coast community, is something that is modeled in the rest of the state. And uh, I think sometimes just, you know, rather than speak about the collaboration in this instance, I'd like to, the Y community often looks to a Y organization not too far away in Foxborough as a goal standard for what they can do. Um, the Y should they get to do it because of money that comes from that community, particular organization in the Foxborough area that funds that community. What happens in the South Coast is largely to the work of creative people, of trusting people with collaborations, and taking limited resources and extending them uh, much, much further than the dollars that have been done. So I come in any time that the government public schools, any school community, any town, you can reach out and work with them. Thank you. We appreciate it. Stacy, do you have anything to Sorry. Uh, once again, thank you for your presentation. We look forward to the program starting up in the middle school and for all the all the work you do with the Dominic Public Schools. And from my own perspective, I love seeing the whole community garden. Uh, that piece of it, I know our students have gone out there, including my daughter and my daughter. So um, it's great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Keep up the good work. We're happy to Thank you. You're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. However, uh, we completely understand if you have some other obligations at the Y or, or family obligations.
like a new Thanks. baby. Like a new baby. Yeah. 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 So one yeah. or two. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. You too. This time we're going to turn it over to our student rep, uh, Stacey Hoffman, for her uh, report. So since tomorrow is election day, the high school is having a school-wide off election, and the voting has already gone underway. It's through the students' online email system, and the students are voting on the four Massachusetts ballot questions, which I think is fantastic, especially for the students who will actually be voting for real 18-year-olds. Um, they're also going to be voting on Congress and the President and Vice President, so that's really exciting. And the results will be in at the end of the day tomorrow. You guys are curious. Excellent. Um, this weekend, the band is going to their national competition at MetLife Stadium on Saturday, so I want to wish them the best of luck. They've done amazing every year, facing at the top, so I know they will have great success there. Uh, I'd like to say congratulations to the football team and the girls' soccer team on amazing seasons in the playoffs. And best of luck to the volleyball team. They're actually playing right now at Vogue and the boys soccer team as they advance in the playoffs. Um, last but not least, there is going to be a PBIS fundraiser uh, at the Pasta House on November 16th and 17th. That's next Wednesday and Thursday. And in order for part of the proceeds to go towards the PBIS program, um, whoever comes needs to print out the flyer, which is on the Dartmouth School Beauty website, or you can just show it on your phone. So. All the proceeds are donated to this program to award students for following the year. Excellent. Glad to see that. Anything else? How's the yes. school year going? Okay. It's going well. Good. Yes. Mr. Chair, is that volleyball game still on for the 22nd? There was something that was going to be Oh, yes, yes. On the 22nd, there's a volleyball tournament mm -hmm. that National Honor Society is putting on. And so we're getting a lot of the police departments, the fire departments involved, there's teacher teams as well as student teams, and um, we'll be selling tickets there. But I think the National Honor Society will be presenting at the next school meeting on the 21st. So, and, oh, yes. Yes. Oh, oh no. well, <laughs> I don't know. So, could they perhaps, they were the, the they were going to present on the 21st, the Honor Society, about their um, volleyball tournament. Is there any way that we could potentially allow them to come into the joint meeting for like two minutes? And there's probably going to be a bigger audience if yeah. all of the uh, boards are together. And just to yeah. at least announce it, could we ask? Sure, I don't have a yeah. problem asking. Yeah, so maybe we can ask a yeah. bigger audience. Sure. What day is that? Next Monday. I don't see why not. Yeah. Just reminding each other we don't forget. What is that? Mr. Chair? Yes. Just while we're on the subject of things at uh, high school and uh, somewhat about it, I noticed that there have been some significant uh, developments in uh, issues related to the athletic program at the MIA level. Yes. And I wonder if it wouldn't be a good idea for us to schedule some time with the athletic director in the near future to this day ahead of the people who are some of those things and how that might impact high school and this and that. We can see if we get that on in the upcoming event. Thank you. All right, next up we have a consent agenda. Uh, first up is the proposed 2017 Unified Arts trip to Ireland. You should have received the application in your school committee packets um, with Dr. Gifford or uh, Right, like the comment, or well, we, we have, have been describing here, so yeah. 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 Come on down. Answer any of your questions, or give some ideas. Good evening, ladies. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. so, would you like me to present? Absolutely. Well, we're proposing to do a trip. We had a preliminary meeting, you know, pending approval with um, parents and students. And it's primarily advanced placement art photo students that would be participating on this trip. And we had a huge parent interest. It's almost every student has a mom or mom that wants to go. Um, so we were planning probably 20 people. Um, we booked preliminarily <coughs> 30, but 20 that were pretty definite. And we're going to go to um, both Southern Ireland as well as Northern Ireland. And we leave on Friday of um, 14, which begins vacation, Good Friday, um, with an evening flight, and we return on 
on that was eight days. Yeah, we return on Saturday, so you have a little bit of recuperation time, so everyone will be able to school on Monday. Um, so we're using um, a tour group, CIE, it's an Irish base, it's based in this country, but the tour guides are Ireland. Personally, my husband and I took our two daughters and used this tour group, not this past summer, the summer before, and it was great. It was so educational, history-based, um, they're very professional. Um, the lodging was wonderful, food, everything, had a very good experience. So everything's really booked out, and as far as with what we would do, Dublin, start in Dublin on day two, see Dublin Castle, um, have some time in the city, and then as you can see, we'll hear St. Patrick's Grave and the Ulster Folk Museum, and then we go more up to Northern Ireland to see um, in Belfast, the Titanic Museum, and the walking tour. Belfast, and then um, Giant's Causeway in the countryside, um, with a focus on photography, of course, and Donegal Castle in Westport, um, then also Westport House and Sheep Farm, and then end at the um, Cliffs of Moor, and with a medieval banquet, and stay at near Bonnerty Castle. So, um, like, you have your private tour director, um, seven nights, hotel, breakfast each day. Dinner, most dinners are included except for two, and all the different tours and admissions to museums were included. Um, we had a price that could fluctuate with flights, because you get the flights that do go up. Um, we're also planning some fundraisers with the kids. We've been shooting ideas around first things first. Once we, if we could receive approval, we'll move forward with that to help kids that and need some funding to help them pay for the trip. Um, that was my, my biggest concern. Uh, my only cat my only kind of that I see with it is that the, the cost of twenty seven fifty is it's a lot of money for some folks. And you know, I don't want that to be a you know a strain on individuals. So you would that's what the fundraising would be going towards trying to defray some of the cost there. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would be proposing proposing um, a big yoga then? Yeah. Um, Sue and I just attended one, which was well received. Um, also, maybe some kind of dinner. Oh, a paint mm -hmm. night, too. You might be doing paint night and find the wine, but we will do painting. And, you know, kids could be you know, directly involved in that with instruction, so that's what we're going to do. We're excited about that. Um, also, we could do sales. I, mean, I teach a metals class, and we do jewelry. It's just timely at this time of year to make sales. And we were proposing a calendar of the AP uh, students' photos. Create mm -hmm. a calendar for them to sell. And that way you can really keep track of who sells what. Mm -hmm. So kids that are more motivated can sell more. And they can get a you know, percentage of what the sales are. So all those things are being worked out. Okay. All those questions? Yes, Mr. Garland. Just, just a, a brainstorm. one. As it is a photography-based trip, and having been to Ireland, I can pretty well be confident they're going to come back with some amazing photos. What if we um, work collaboratively together, come up with some sort of a new faith, where in addition to not just the stylistic and technical approaches to photography, we also were talking about a career in photography, specifically freelancing, where we arranged ahead of time to have students come back and sell some of the better photos that they got, which in you know, uh, museum type atmosphere it might generate significantly more revenue than perhaps some of the fundraising you could have. Like an opening with sales, I think a gallery opening. Right. Yeah. We, we were actually talking with that too to do a show because it would be probably included in the art show. Mm -hmm. You know, this work would be included in the like, AP portfolio which goes out in May with the same as in May. So that would be a that would be a wonderful idea. And we had um, it's funny, we had Peter Ferrara came in to talk to the classes, and this is when we were working this out, and we had the parents and the kids both voted, we were looking at Scotland, and <coughs> so we asked Peter, where would you go? And he's a photojournalist, he said, oh, I'd go to Ireland in a second, because I'm more interested in people than the scene. You know, so there are different perspectives, and you know, as a career, was, he did a great talk, and he, some of the kids, Changing their intended major schedules and you know, following your heart with what you love and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? 
Yeah. I've already heard. Already, it's already yeah. expressed. Yeah. I'm on. I'm on. Well, I'm on board. <laughs> Carry luggage, give guided tours. I, mean, I just spent. I was there last not this past summer before. It was there for two weeks. And, as I was going through this over the weekend, it was like they've been there, been there, been there. You know, it's 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 where you're going is just it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent of schools, Dr. Gifford, uh, to go over the, uh, continue our conversation on the superintendent evaluation timeline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you have uh, a draft timeline for the process for this year, and as I said in my email, I need some help with those dates. Just think, uh, see what you think is um, an efficient timeline. So we'll go over that. You also received the three SMART goals um, that we've crafted for this year. Um, I did meet with the subcommittee, which included the chair and Dr. Jenkins, and um, we kind of crafted these and uh, edited them. Uh, so I'd just like to um, articulate those out loud for our folks. Um, so we have a district improvement goal um, about relative to supporting the implementation of the district strategic plan course. So one of the things we're going to be doing is to form a, a committee that we don't, I can't stand continuing to say committees, but a group that would, uh, folks from each school to be able to come together maybe three times or so to report to the larger group what's happening in our schools according to our SIPs and how are our SIPs aligning with the strategic plan and then be able to report to the school committee a couple times um, once towards the middle of the year or so and are we meeting some of our benchmarks and how are we doing with our strategic objectives. So that's our district improvement goal. Uh, the professional practice goal that I gave you is about once again collaborating with the leadership team to continue our work around educational evaluation. As you remember last year we had a lot of work we did with our consultant and we're going to continue some of that work, doing some joint observations. We've done some work already in our district leadership team about um, crafting our observation feedback with the CEIJ uh, format. And so we'll be continuing that work, critiquing each other's work, et cetera, bringing some write-ups. So that's our professional, my professional practice goal. And then our student learning goal, as we talked about, Actually, Ms. Roy, Ms. Oliveira, and I have collaborated on, on a team goal, and we are proposing to work with our math team at our high school specifically. We do want to pull in some of our middle school as well to get that vertical alignment. But that will be planning to have some professional development, so working on curriculum alignment, et cetera, um, some instructional strategies. So we've already met with the math team at the high school. Um, actually. Michelle and Tracy met with a number of times, and then we met as a team uh, the last weekend. We'll be doing again this week, and we'll be bringing um, one of the things we're doing is UMass Dartmouth. We're partnering with them to do some PD with us, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know uh, from the entry plan last year, um, our math, we just want to improve and strengthen what we're doing around the math throughout the district. And um, we're honing in right now because you always want to be specific with your goals. Um, right now, we're in math school and a little bit of that vertical line for the middle school. So those are our three goals. Uh, well, my three goals. Um, that's a team goal, that one. Um, so I would take any comments on that. And then we can look at the uh, draft timeline, which isn't much different than last year, but just about oh. when you think with the meetings, we would be doing mid cycles, etc. We'll start with uh, Mr. News. Yeah, no, I'm uh, very happy with the uh the goals and what's been presented. So I see no issues with that. Uh, as far as the timeline, it looks good to me. We just got a couple of things we've got pointed right. yeah. between April and May, but I think that timeline uh, works well. Okay. Hey, Mr. Newman, Mr. Gar. No, I, I concur with Mr. Newman. I think you know, superintendents have made good progress on the goals from last year. The ones that were selected for this year now uh, in line with the needs of the district and they wanted the progress you made so far. So I'm very comfortable. I'm good. I was on the yeah, yeah, you should be right. Right. <laughs> discussed this reflects uh, my input already. Dr. So Dr. Jenkins and I have already uh, been over this. So um like Dr. Jenkins said, I have you know no problems about it. Any any concerns that you have we brought to the meeting. Um, you know, I think the uh, one piece you know we maybe just look at is the uh, the mid cycle. I think I think January 9th should be should be okay. You think that's I think so. Okay. 
All right, we probably won't have a whole lot to, to talk about. Right. At least it's a mid cycle because I'd rather have early than we make adjustments as we go. Agreed. Or at least you hear what's happening. I think early. I think early personally is better. Yeah. Yeah. And as we recall from last year and our training with uh, for the presser and the mid cycle is an oral discussion about where the committee feels things are going, etc. Yeah. You don't have too many writers. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, so if we continue around this timeline, uh, just looking at the individual, as we said, to um, the chair by the end of May, with the formal evaluations, the write-ups, and the summative. I think that's about where we were last year. We have not set a June meeting yet, so I kind of just threw that in there. Sure. And we can finalize things then if that's... And I know last year we just did this a little bit as time went on, but at least we have a general yeah. idea. Something to go by. Yeah. No so it's, I would take um, the committee would approve the goals and the media. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Mr. Garth, second by Mr. Nunes on the motion in the discussion. Jay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion all right, thank you. The goals are approved. Thank you. We continue under new business school committee policy update canine therapy assistance first rating you should have received that attachment in your packets. Uh, will, uh, Ms. Roy, you talking about that? Sure. Um, subcommittee met in October um, for um, this is DeCampos' uh, presentation at our last meeting, meeting. So we met in anticipation of that. And we looked at the animals in school car policy to see where it needed to be adjusted. Um, so we already had a um, section on the bottom of page one um, referencing fur bearing animals with the asterisk on the dogs is already in our current policy. So what we did at that point was look at um, adding to the exception. So if you flip over on the second page where it says exception, this was already in our policy, we had guide hearing with other service dogs or law enforcement dogs. Yep. So we added registered canine assisted therapy dogs. So that's the um, change we made to those first two pages. Okay, so it's right at the top third of page two. Then in the policy, there was already a component explaining what a service animal was. That was already in the policy. So the committee asked that I develop um, a similar piece for therapy dogs, what a therapy dog is. So the first paragraph explains um, a, a little bit of what Mrs. DeCampo has presented about the benefits. And then it defines the different types so you'll see on the bottom of page three, um, we have animal-assisted activities, usually referred to as AAA, animal-assisted interactions, which are AAI. These are non-folder interactions where the specific content of the visit um, is meant to provide motivational education and recreation in his part of life. What she's proposing is more of the second component, the animal-assisted therapy, which is gold <coughs> intervention. And then Mrs. DeCampos' piece, um, occupational therapy specific. So these would be where a student may be brushing the dog, or the dog may have something coming on it, or the student may be and things like that. So um, the last piece was already in the policy, that last paragraph, which says the superintendent of school or his or her designee shall be responsible for developing procedures to go along with this. So what I provided for you in addition to the policy, which you don't have to vote the procedural guidelines, so you get a sense of what the guidelines sure. would look like. So the guidelines lay out the training that's required, the health and vaccination that's required, the licensing, the insurance, um, the identification that's required for the uh, handler, therapy dog, um, what is included under the control of me as far as the length of the leash, the supervision of the therapy dog, the areas, allergies, record keeping, um, 
that it was, he was charged um, that all dogs need to be registered on the site, um, damages or exclusion, and then they proposed what we're working on for um, a request and the um, handler, which would go to the approval policy, approval of the superintendent of schools, having them request all of what's required in the building. So that's, that was provided just so you would get a sense of what that last paragraph references as far as the guidelines. Okay. So what we did to policy again on the bottom of page one, there was already the asterisk for the dogs. We added the exception, which was already there, for the guide and hearing, so the animals may not be registered, canine assisted, and then the very end, just a description of what those means. So this is the first reading. I have any questions? This is the this is here again on hand. Um, or any suggestions? Comments, questions, concerns. I think this was very well together. The the additional policy. So I just make one suggestion on the form, the request form, is that perhaps we add an area where we outline any conditions. Like we talked about if you go into a school that you might say we only want it to come in through this entrance and to be in this area. And so that way I found with my interactions with students and whatnot, everyone's on the same page because sometimes you have verbal interactions and people misunderstand whereas if all those sort of conditions about maybe where the dog will go or whatever are written and then everyone signs to it it's clear that everyone's mm -hmm. on the same page so so you're saying like, this is the this is the handler, the handler with the, yes. this is what the handler's filling out then maybe on the back there might be something that's a, from the school or the principal's perspective this is where the dog's going to go you know please don't go here this or that um, so that's very clear, clearly spelled out to the handler as well, and they know um, what sort of their obligations are and where they should be. So the principal, the principal would probably is providing yes. feedback to the handler. Yeah, and so that so, so just that person knows, right? And they have a point of reference. Like if you end up going to four schools and you're like, wait, what? What door do I go in at Quinn? Where do I go in at Potter? You can pull out your piece of paper, and that's all written down about how that should operate, and then we have a record of it. Uh, Mr. News? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would think that they're going to go in from the main entrance that they might go in the site. So that right, but there may be places they may not be, they should not go because well, maybe Well, that's not so much where they're not going to go, but their, their interest in the building. Right, but but whatever there. those conditions about where they should go or not go should be written down so everyone that's oh, I, a party to yeah. the agreement can understand what those conditions are. Mr. Garrow? I, I think the part that troubles me the most uh, about this is stems a little bit from what Dr. Jenkins' point is, and I think Dr. Jenkins' point is a good one. Um, the second to the last paragraph in the policy says, a therapy job is the personal property of the handler, and is not the property of the school district. And then it goes on to who has full responsibility for the dog while it's there. Full responsibility carries with it uh, some obvious um, issues in our indigenous society. Um, should something go wrong? <coughs> I think Dr. Jenkins' point is a good one. My question is, how, how reliable is that language if something were to go wrong, and what is the liability that we're setting up the district for, especially if we water down the uh, responsibility for the dog while it's in the school with restrictions that would be different from one school to another, that would not be set by the superintendent, they would be set by the principal, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I would hope that before we take this up again, that there is some greater conversation about exactly where the limits of responsibility and liability are when you bring an animal into the building. And it's, in my mind, it's questionable about who's responsible for all of it. Yes. And I just want to follow up and say that's not what my concerns were. Oh, they no, are the right. Yeah, are um, I just want everyone to make sure we're all on the same page. And I found that when we have these conversations, that writing them down are clear. I'm not particularly concerned about liability, um, and so I don't want that to be sort of attributed. That I have any opposition to this policy because I am in support of it. Right. No, I have no opposition to the policy. I think what you said, providing some type of feedback on the other side from the building principal to the handler is where the dog can and I go. I think that's probably feasible. Um, 
the liability, I guess it can't hurt. Can maybe have a conversation with Walter? Or, uh, yeah, we do have a clause about the insurance. Uh, I did notice that the insurance is in the liability. Um, so uh, I'm pretty comfortable with liability, but uh, in the sake of Mr. Garth's uh, question, if we could just uh, get some clarification from the legal. Anything else? So we're all on the same page that when this comes back for a second reading, that uh, we'd like to see just something in addition that Shannon was speaking about and myself about and the other the backside of the, the form about you know, some information from the building and they still didn't uh, no, Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out again. Um, next up. FY18 budget timeline. Turn it over to Mr. Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. So we have before you a projected timeline. There's some um, some dates in there that are to be determined based on uh, future school committee meetings and other events in the community. But generally speaking, um, the timeline is fairly consistent with what we've done um, in recent years. It's an aggressive timeline for sure, um, but it's one that I think will work well, allow us some time to collaborate um, first internally and with the budget subcommittee and then uh, onto the town stage. So I, I think that uh, some of the limitations of this timeline um, we've talked about in the past, but are that the state uh, budget projections and the the, uh, we'll have governor's numbers, but we won't have much else um, during the bulk of this process. So that is somewhat limiting, um, but it does get us hopefully to a point where we can work with the, the town side of government prior to town meeting and get this squared away. So we're looking forward to, to doing it all over. Seems like we just <laughs> yeah. seems like we just did. I know. <laughs> So I'd be happy to entertain any sure. questions you might have or comments. Mr. Nunes? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I shared my concerns with, uh, with Mr. Kiley uh, in regards to the timeline here in the sense that all we're going to have is
Tuesday night. And uh, what you have that's been given to you is the uh, PowerPoint presentation that the uh, town superintendent school district has put together. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You know, it's, it's all here as to what they've been looking at and such uh, for you. But uh, there were six districts that were there that night. Uh, found, of course, they have the lead. Uh, Barnstable, Mashpee, uh, Plymouth, Situate, and us. Type of deal. Uh, when you look at this printout, you're going to see a, a timeline from Falmouth, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, like a vote of the school committee in May of 2017. The reason that vote is scheduled at that point in time is that they're planning on having all the work done at that point. Uh, there are elections out in May, and there could be three new members on their committee. So this way, this work is done. Falmouth is not going to implement this if they implement it uh, until 2018, okay. se September of 2018. Constable uh, is looking at this. They hired a consultant, so just, just you know to, to do some research and start building some data on it. Uh, Mashpee is there. They're going uh, full bore in the sense that they're uh, going through all of this and they're, going to, they're looking to try to start this out in September of 2017. Type of deal. Because we're just in, as I said to them, we're just literally starting to talk about it type of deal. Uh, the town of Plymouth is just looking at it. They're, again, they're just starting the process. And uh, the two people that were there from Situate didn't say anything, you know, pros and cons or anything of that nature. But uh, it was an excellent uh, evening of, of information. Uh, there were a lot of things that came out. Uh, bus transportation was a big thing. Uh, you need to put more buses on, depending on the, the layout of the school. That type of deal, of course, that becomes a town expense versus a part of that school spending. So there was a lot of discussion there. Uh, if you move high school to start later, did you move the elementaries back? Now, at this point in time, you have you know elementary students standing on a bus, you know, standing on a bus stop at quarter seven in the morning in pitch black, especially as you know the times the timing has changed now with the, with the uh, lights back. Uh, the clock's being turned back. Uh, someone brought up the coaches. Would they be available? Because if you have coaches in elementary and or high school, you know, are they available to still be able to coach with a later start time? Like the One of the things I, I mentioned and nobody had thought about, which was interesting, is uh, it's not too bad in, you know, September and the beginning of October, you know, the high school got out at 3.30 for practicing, uh, for practice, you know, it's still light out. But, you know, if they got out at 3.30 now, they've got roughly 45 minutes before it's going to be pitch black. And, you know, if this, you don't have facilities with lights that they can practice at, you know, there's, there's an issue there. Uh, somebody talked about, uh, well, maybe you move the practices the first thing in the morning. Type of deal. Well, that defeats the whole purpose of students you know, being able to get an extra hour of sleep, you know. The thing, the key was, you know, the other thing that came out was, okay, so we moved, for discussion purposes, we moved to high school and water past the start again, just as a discussion, okay. Well, you still, are you still able to get your child to bed at 10 o'clock, or the, the child say, well, I don't have to be up, I can sleep an hour later in the morning, so I don't have to go to bed till 11 o'clock. You know, so you, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of things in the mix. You know, a lot of options that have to come in, you know, students with jobs, things of that nature. Uh, I think one of the best things that was in there, and it's in your packet, um, there was a graph about student bedtimes. You know, they, they polled the students as to what time did you go to bed, and another one, they polled the parents what time does your child go to bed, and they didn't mix. They didn't, they didn't, you know, that, that they weren't there at all. You know, it's, and as, as you know, some of the parents said, you know, well, Johnny or Susie goes to goes to bed at 9:30, but you know, at 10:30 we still hear them walking around because they're reading, they've got a TV, they've got a computer in their room, they've got all this stuff. So they're still doing things instead of trying to sleep. So 
it was a, again, I'd like to thank Alma for, for, for taking the lead in this, and it was a very enjoyable and uh, learning experience that night. Well, thank you for attending. I appreciate it. Did, did anyone bring up any schools in the area that have already made the change? No, no one brought that up. Mm. No, I, I, I would be curious. Do we know of any school Nossett, districts? I think, I think I thought that Nossett came in. Oh, the Nossett that's been doing it for years. Nossett came, yeah. And then, you know, they, they did say so that they were much, used to They're work. one of the only ones that have made the no, There are some school districts up near Boston. Boston, 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 Boston. Not Boston. our area. They did, it, they did it as a collaborative thing among several communities who mm -hmm. share some of the same concerns. Right. And, yeah. Well, I'd be curious. I would love to have a conversation with these school districts that have made the change number one. Before I would even entertain doing that, I would like to hear what the uh, vision of the committee is as to how you would like to, and if and how you would like to pursue um, considering time change. If I may, I think Mr. Newman's points out you know, remarkably well that this is a very complicated issue. That when you begin talking about it, there are people on all sides of it, sometimes on opposite sides at the same time of the issue. It's very emotional, um, it's very difficult, and there are some ways to make it go very badly, very quickly. So are you against it? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not against having the conversation. Okay. Okay. One of the things that I would like to perhaps talk about before we talk about a universal change or uh, uh, sort of like an enormous change, right, would be to talk about perhaps a way to close the gap between the high school and middle school starting in time. We're talking about 90 minutes right now. If we could close that gap to say 60 minutes, that seems like a project that you know, the high school starts at 7 30 and the elementary start at 9 o'clock. Oh, okay, you said, you said middle school. You said middle school. School. I'm sorry, high school and middle starting at 7 30. Oh. No, I'm just starting at 7 o'clock, <laughs> not at If we could talk about shrinking that gap, that might be something that would fit in the new wheelhouse of our administrators. It might be something that we could talk about, um, and perhaps not about a revolutionary change to start times, but perhaps we're talking about a revolutionary change to transportation. And that might give us a compromise solution to what I think we all recognize as a real problem. You know, one that perhaps better suits and might be outcomes of families, no matter what you do. Because I think John's the research does show John's point. If you move the start time to an hour, kids just stay up there. Kids stay up later because their bodies are biologically not programmed to fall asleep at 10 o'clock. It is science, right? The melatonin in the teenagers' bodies does not start to peak until around 11 o'clock. So you can tell them to go to bed at 10 o'clock all you want, but they are fighting basic biology. I wish Mr. Vieira was here. She might be able to back me up on that one. Um, and that is, I think, the real issue here. And I understand this is really, really complicated, but to me, the number one priority in any decision we have to make is about our kids' academic and social emotional well being. And the research about start times is overwhelming. It's overwhelming, right? This is positive for their academic achievement, it is positive for their social emotional well being. And to me, that's got to be I understand, like, right? my kids play sports, it's going to make it hard. I'd rather sports be hard than school be hard, right? I understand that kids need to work. Right? I'd rather work be hard and school be hard. Um, I feel really strongly about it, and I know we have to do this carefully, um, but I really would like to see the district move forward on this. This is a particular challenge for us because we're so big physically. Um, and I know it's problematic having young kids go out to the bus late, but some of those high school kids are getting the bus at like 6, 10, I think, Mr. Kiley, up north. Right. Yeah. They got to get up before 6 o'clock. Their bodies literally do not work that way. Um, and we've got to set up a school system that works for our kids. Um, and that's got to be our number, that's my number one priority. And so I do agree we have to do this carefully. Um, but I really would like to move forward on this conversation because I think it's important. I always joke I always start these important conversations and then my kids graduate and they implement them. Which is what will happen here again. 
free full day kindergarten, year after my kids get out of kindergarten. And I'm confident that this will be, if we get this forward, it'll be right after my you know, youngest graduates from high school. But um, I'm not only motivated by what's good for me and my sleep and my kids, but what's good, I think, for all the kids in the first year. Thank you. Now let's, let's hear from our high school rep. Uh -huh. So I kind of agreed with Mr. James when he said that you'd stay an hour later just because it's starting an hour later. Because um, I didn't know that personally I would do that <laughs> just because I know I'd have more sleep. But then the other point of view is if you're getting home an hour later or two hours later, you have less time to do your as well or like less time to have a job. So I see that aspect of it, and I don't know how that can be remedied, but I do think that teenagers might need to get into real sleep, and there is scientific knowledge about that. I know like, I have a younger sister, and she's always up at least an hour before me, and she's always in bed an hour before me, and that's just biological physics, so. I don't really know why I'm going okay. I'm kind of in the middle. Fair enough, fair enough. But I know that if there is a change, I don't think it should be too drastic. I just want to say that um, you know I was in NASIF when we did this flip <coughs> in a number of years, and um, interesting enough, the elementary schools go like at 7:30 in the morning, so all the elementaries are really early. Miss Pops are ready to go at 7:30. <laughs> <laughs> this, nope. this is this principal of <laughs> um, But anyway, uh, but the statistics were very clear once the switch was made in the middle and high school, especially the high school. Actually, Nauset is the latest starting middle school in the state, and around nine or so. Um, the number of absentees, the number of tardies, and the number of failures for first block classes completely decreased because kids were now ready to learn. Um, so the data was really drastic as far as the good stuff. Um, Having started the conversation in Falmouth there, and we did all the research, we just so figured, FYI, if we were to continue the conversation, uh, the way we did it was partnered up with Barnstable to do two community events, community informational sessions, so that we weren't there to just make the change of that, obviously, immediately, but to bring out the stuff that we knew would be an issue. Uh, older kids being at home to babysit, uh, sports, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then take all the questions, all the venting, all the information to try to then find ways to solve each one of those with any kind of a shift. And of course, um, having the transportation come up with the different scenarios of if there were added buses to accommodate, if there weren't, how long the routes might be. You know, one of the things sometimes the committees don't want is over a 45-minute drive on the bus, etc. So there's a way to start the conversation and include the community and just hear what all the different um, problems might be or concerns. And, and as Stacy said, sometimes it, it doesn't have to be a complete flip, but it could be a half an hour move or so. And then I kind of like that idea of looking, is there a way to move the starting <coughs> middle and high a little later, but yet condense the elementary a tiny bit so they're not going that much. So, but, of course, that's looking at bus routes, et cetera. Mr. Garth, you know, one of the things that is about the community conversation, it needs to include the people who are going to be part of the solution, daycare facilities, right. and employers, and, um, you know, the police, and the, uh, the transportation, and all those kinds of things, because they ultimately have to be part of and willing to, to work with you know, what's happening. And the other part that needs to be there is the cooperation of Fairhaven and Westport and New Bedford and, and Cushion because there are things that, that affect families that cross those lines okay, much more significantly than we think so. Mr. Means. Thank you, Mr. Chip. Yeah. Uh, again, one of the things that Jake was talking about is they did spend a lot of time talking about social and uh, emotional needs of, of the student. Uh, again, if you look at this, they put a complete task force together as to, to bring in, you know, anybody and, and everybody uh, to the point that they also brought in a, a local pediatrician to, to work with them and, and such. They're not jumping into this. They're trying to do things in a systematic way. Uh, everyone was in total agreement that 
whatever you make, if you make this, that whatever you do, you're going to have people that are going to be happy and people that are not. You're not going to please everyone. And you like the drink of just trying to make the best decision, inform the decisions through the information that you have. Agreed. So what I'm hearing is that the, the committee, I think, would like to proceed slowly. And we're looking at continuing some research um, and then taking whatever next step that might be, Dr. Gifford, whether it's um, getting some community groups together, putting it out there, having some, some discussions, and those people involved, but we'll leave that up to you as far as that next okay. step. Um, but I, I, do, I do think we're all on the same page in which we like to cautiously proceed with researching and better understanding how this will affect um, the students, the parents, um, all the stakeholders. I wonder if, you know, if we take that of the select board and the income would be appropriate. And they were looking at solutions um, a year ago for some of the distressed properties. They had one group look at some general policies. They had another group look at some very specific solutions. I wonder if, well, you know, the superintendent is trying to work to build community consensus around something. If there isn't a way to look at our existing systems and what can be tweaked in just what we do internally that might accomplish something. And then, you know, bring those things back together, which may be, you know, totally opposition to one another, or they may be more in concert than we think, and we may have a fix that's closer to our, you know, So you're suggesting our committee? Or, 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 or you know, or sort of, you know, not so much a subcommittee, but, you know, if the district went in two different approaches, maybe Dr. Griffith went in one district, and uh, Mr. Kiley and, you know, Chris went in a different group. I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, We'd like to you know, continue this conversation you know, maybe next month. And um, really no timeline on it, but right. just we'd like to report back to us and maybe next month, month after is the next step. What's the next step? Because I think we're all in agreement that something needs to be done, whether it's small or big. Next stop, topics for discussion for our joint meeting with the Select Board on November 14, 2016. I think I will turn this over to uh, Mr. Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. So we have several things that we give for time that with uh, Mr. Preston to discuss this, this joint meeting. And there are some things on the agenda that we just wanted to bring forward to you folks so we could have some discussion and let you know um, that why they're on the agenda, I guess. Um, so full day kindergarten stabilization account. As you know, we've contributed uh, $300,000 to this stabilization account for the years. We did not make a contribution um, this, this past year. We, um, the, the agreement says that if we have money, we'll make a contribution. Um, but the reality of the, of, of the stabilization account is that it's probably never going to be used for what, what its intended purpose was. Um, so that leaves us with some decision that at some point needs to be made. We had some discussion last year about <coughs> at, the, at one of the joint meetings, and um, we just kind of left it alone, um, which we could continue to do and just leave it there. Uh, or we could look at uh, options to uh, discontinue it, use it for something else, um, all of which would require, you know, may require a town meeting vote at some point. And everything. Um, but we, you know, one of the things that came up that we do have, we mentioned already, is we have a defined need for preschool. Um, this is pretty close, you know, it's fairly close to the original purpose of, of, of the kindergarten um, stabilization. So that would be part of the discussion um, and how we could, you know, how we could use those funds in a way that would expand the program, which is exactly what we did when we established the first one, which was expand programming. So um, I like that idea. Topic for discussion, mm -hmm. perhaps, on um, that digital meeting. As a reminder, we added a K class this year at our Christian school, and we're at our max level there, even with the addition of class. So um, we discussed this morning, and uh, knowing that we have the joint, uh, we, we Look for the community to think about that idea of using that for a pre-K up at the 
taking up our school, whether it's putting modules on to house our students, but any additional support we can give to pre-K students just helps our K classes. Right. Um, it provides our students with that you know, beginning education. That's all their needs. It's all early ed. Um, so we're, we're, we think that's a priority. We'd really like to see, as you said tonight, um, add some great pre-K classes. So if, this, if there's something we can do. So we're putting out the committees here um, as we go forth with the joint meeting. And if I could just add to that, that um, Ms. Roy brought up this morning that, uh, you know, we're really looking at the, the town in general has um, always been a focus on using the one time monies for recurring expenditures, and we've had that discussion many times. These are certainly monies, um, you know, that were put away. Uh, there are potentially, depending on how this was to, to move forward and how Vision preschool would be some one time expenditures that um, you know, would be consistent with that. So, so might, it may be a good thing. Next? Next up. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the facilities master plan. So, <coughs> we were uh, fortunate enough that the town supported our articles in the capital improvement plan at the last town meeting. Um, and one of the articles was for a master plan. So we want to get this rolling. Um, I'm in the process. I've got some sample RFP stuff that I'm working on um, to hire a designer. But um, some of the things that we wanted to look at, uh, Mr. Cressman asked us what you put on the, the joint committee agenda. Um, I think I think the thought is to um, have some time input on in that process. Um, so it's something that maybe we should talk about first, what we envision. And some of the things that, that I want to get out of it is really have them focus on a couple of things. Capacity and enrollment, development potential in, in the town. Um, and some recent work has been done on the development side and I've, I've received today actually um, from the uh, planning office some, some good information about available parcels. It's hot off the presses. Um, uh, looking at our educational programming, so that would include something like preschool programming, um, you know, amongst other things. Looking at the existing facility infrastructure and what we would need based on that programming and enrollment and, and development. And then creating some short and long term plans um, that would help drive our capital improvement process on a kind of big scale. Because we've done a lot with capital improvements. However, we haven't done a lot of big, I mean, hey, a $4 million roof is big, but it's not looking at the future. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's time. It's replacing. It's time we it's look not. at our buildings. Right. I know people do not want to hear that because that usually involves increases in taxes. Right. But however, it's time we need to look to the future, look at our investment, which is the children in this town, and let's, you know, long term. What are we going to do? The last, the last study that was done uh, of the school facilities, um, formal study was in 1995. Um, so it's been a while. Uh, we still have most of the same buildings, except one. Um, but it was a major factor in moving forward with the one building. That we do have now. Okay, so. It's also, you know, at this point, a requirement for us to do any significant business. MSPCA, you know, MSBA with the, with the builders themselves. They, they, you know, indicated to us in the past that they'd be very willing to work with us on our long-term solution. But that's the ingredient number one. It is, it is, and they ask us about that, and I always say, yes, we have a long-term plan. Well, we have a plan. It's our capital improvement plan. It's a five-year plan. And I explain the process, and that's great. It's great when we're going for a roof or something like that, but it's not going to be enough. Um, so, uh, on that note, I think, again, I think that the intention is probably um, the, the fact that this is on the joint agenda, maybe not only to have me explain what we just talked about right. now, but also to <coughs> talk about how this process is going to go forward, what input different groups of talent have now. 
Well, I'd like to I'd like to be a part of the group, obviously, the chair of the school committee. And I don't know how everyone else in the committee feels as far as the types of stakeholders that could or would be, would be part of the uh, master planning group committee. Um, so before we move on to the joint meeting and have this discussion, any thoughts or opinions on getting other stakeholders involved at this level? Or do you feel that, you know, the facility master plan is a school department piece and we should just keep it in the school department? Mr. Mr. I think it's a, this is a double-edged sword, I think, because it's for us, but it's also going to involve the town. Agreed. So I, I think uh, to have school department personnel and uh, someone maybe from the finance committee and the board of selectmen or the designees, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, maybe you want to get the town planner just because of what's out there and, you know, what could we build where uh, and, and or maybe the building inspector or associate building inspector just so that as we start to formulate things, uh, you know, we know what they have to look like and, you know, what rules and regulations we have to follow building-wise, building code-wise, things of that nature. I agree. I'm, I'm, I, I think an order for... I'm not, I'm not trying to make this, you know, a 50 more percent committee. More convoluted writer. You know, I mean, I, I, I envision, you know, seven, eight, nine people maybe type of deal. But in all, let's think about it, in order for the master plan for, to ever become a fruition, you know, as far as the physical stick buildings going up or being renovated, um, I think we need to have other people involved. And we need to have, um, I'm not saying everyone, like you said, but key, key people from the town involved to, um, you know, create buy-in amongst those yeah. but also assist with, you know, best areas or the, the trends in town, so I'm trying to I mean, I agree we have to have other people at the table, but it is our plan, and so the majority of the members ought to be from the school committee, so, because it is our plan, and so we, we ought to have the, the vote, but, so I worry that as we, now we're starting to get really big, because John, and I agree, all those people are good, but we got five or six, well now we've got to have a majority, so now we're up to like 13 to 15, so I don't think we want to bet. So I think those are all interests that ought to be represented, but I think we need to maybe slice it more narrowly a little bit to start, because I do think we should be on the school side driving the process and have the majority of votes on that committee. And that's, why, I'm sorry, I that's why I said, you know, you know, five, seven, nine people type of deal, you know, three or four on our side, if we have nine, we should be at five at least from our side, right? That's all I want to make sure of. We got a number. That's fine. I'm going to whip it up here. I'm going to count those votes. Yeah, Mr. Guy. I also, I, I think the town's recent experience with the police station is informative here. From moment to one, the town was mixing up solution with problem and investigation of that problem. And I think more than anything, that has played the development of that, and I'm not sure the town has escaped that problem yet. Um, I think we ought to do our best to separate the, what happens with the plan from the developing of the understanding of the need part of the plan. It should be in the hands of consultants, of expertise, who study building construction, they study literary finance, they study educational use. So I, I would say that any conversations that take place with, with the big time and the select board uh, about who's going to be on a committee that's going to have buy-in are premature until we understand what the problem is from a technical standpoint. Because I love this town, but as I've said many, many times, it is a town of 40,000 people and sometimes thinks it only has 14,000 people. And the solutions of a very, very big place are not quite as cozy sometimes and familiar with those in the town and our business. Thank you, Mr. So, moving forward for our joint meeting. And for, for the, I'm sorry, no, I'll put you all these opinions. For for the actual facilities master plan. You know, basically I've had, the, I had a conversation with Mr. Kiley earlier, and at this point it really involves, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
going to involve putting on an RFP, doing some interviews with some architect, and then bringing the architect in, doing the interviews, and then hiring or awarding the contract to the architect. And then uh, Mr. Kiley and then uh, Mr. Ferreira will be you know, collecting some data and whatnot. And then at some point, they'll report back with the, with the findings of the committee of the, um, of the master plan. So I don't know. I, I don't know where to go with this. Can we just focus group? Can we include that in our RFP that we need a focus group at town hall? We need a focus group at the finance committee. And so then that way there's those, all those people are having input into the process, but they're not part of a committee to bog it down, bog down the professionals. Um, so I, I think that way that also allows anyone who might have any expertise or interest um, to be able to come sit at the table. We could, you know, you can open it up to maybe some of even community broadly um, to do that and to provide some input into the process. I like that. Okay. Thank you. On the next step, athletic field. Athletic field. So um, we wanted to. This this again was uh, brought up by Mr. Cressman for the agenda. So um, we are in the process of formulating our capital improvement plan. Uh, will be brought to you at the <coughs> school committee meeting. So um, one of the things that, that I wanted to. One of the things. The, the only thing that didn't get in uh, this last plan was the stadium renovations. So in preparation for this plan, I really wanted to gather some feedback from you folks as to how high of a priority, um, two things, I guess, how high of a priority the stadium renovation would be to you and where you want to see it in the capital improvement plan. And then also, uh, I was thinking there, there are a couple of ways to do this. We originally brought it forward. We brought it forward as one big project, and um, the response that we got, the official response, was that it, it would need to be a debt exclusion. There are ways to break this project into pieces that would make it more manageable, um, and time-wise, it may take longer, um, but could still end up with the same result or even a better result um, without having to look at a debt exclusion. So um, if we looked at lights, turf, and general improvements to the stadium um, as three separate pieces, let's say, that may be something that we could break up into manageable chunks that uh, may be more palatable in terms of the overall process, general improvement process. So I just really wanted to get your thoughts on those sure. things. What's the total cost right now? Uh, well, we, we, right now we had it at we had it at one we had it at one point two, um, and it, it may be a little higher than that. We've gotten uh, we just got prices for uh, LED lighting, um, replacement lighting. That's looking at about two hundred seventy thousand um, dollars. The turf is probably going to be about eight hundred thousand dollars, and then depending on what we do with the stadium itself, the stadium needs some attention. And um, there are some ADA improvements that need to be made. There's, there's a number of things that need to be made. Um, and there, that is probably scalable. You know, we could really look at doing it right or just doing the bare minimum. And you know, so that, that part of the project is the, the most variable cost. I, I personally would love to see us go after the, the full amount in all in one full suit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because this is a project that it's, yes, it's the school department property, the stadium, but let's face it, the town uses the stadium. You know, it's the center of a lot of things that goes on in this town. A lot of youth groups that use it, not to mention the band that uses it quite frequently. Quite frequently. Um, so ideally, I would love to see us taking it all one full swoop, but Mr. Kiley does bring up a very good point as far as getting creative with funding it without having to even entertain. I, I wouldn't entertain a debt exclusion anyway, but um, you know, without having to go after anything else by breaking, chunking the project up. Um, so thoughts? Uh, I think just to that point, one of the things about breaking it up is it would require. Uh, 
collaboration with other groups in the town that I think would advance the project much more quickly, that I think are appropriate, but might be hard for some people to respond. What do you mean? Uh, I think when we talk about ownership of, of, the, of the property, if it belongs to the school, we are eligible for certain funding, it belongs to the town, and I think if we can enhance the facility okay, through getting CPC funds or something like that, that ought to be a more important goal than it is uh, to decide who manages the use of it because in the end that gets really easy. But to, to Mr. Kiley's point about how important it is, the, the, the stadium is tangential to every other conversation we have. It's part of the master plan. It is part of facilities that would allow us to make a schedule, school hour change because it would change resources and how and, and where we, and when we could use them. It is part of how the town funds recreation in this community. <coughs> and of course, it's also part of the budget. So I think it may not be central to each of those issues, but it is definitely a tangential part of it, and it could be a solution to some of these things as well. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, first and foremost, you can't use CPA funds. Meaning preservation funds cannot be used. Artificial terms. No, but it can be used for the service on me. Mm -hmm. If that's all that means that, that you may get a little tweaky, yeah, but that's a discussion for, for later on. Uh, that statement needs major work because someone who sits up not moves doing the uh, announcing type of deal would be very difficult to see the item items. And God bless Alan Gray for the work that he does on that field, other than that, would be, uh, it'd be a total luck. We don't realize the gem we have in Alan Rayleigh and the work that he does on that field to keep it uh, as good a condition as it is type of deal. Uh, a, couple of, and a, a, couple, a couple of things that we could go about trying to fund, to fund this thing. Uh, one of the things is, is maybe, you know, come May, if there's money left that hasn't been appropriated from free cash, so that's what we the town puts a chunk of that into a stabilization fund for a few improvements, you know, for five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, you get to May of, uh, you know, you get into September, October of 2017, FY18, uh, and they've got some decent free cash that they can put some more money into it, maybe enough to get it completed, so that in the course of a couple of years we've got the money available to do it, and we haven't chunked it all in one fell swoop or then we can do everything in one swoop. I mean to do the lights and even fields is going to take, you know, five or six months. So you're almost sparking uh, either no football or no spring sports there, i.e. Right? lacrosse. Boys and girls lacrosse are also you know once the, the weather breaks April first, uh, to, to ripping everything up if you haven't haven't been able to get to it beforehand to uh, get everything replaced, get the lights replaced, you know, get the new wiring, get the field down, things of that nature. The other thing I think we could possibly look at doing is with artificial turf, you're then eligible to have other activities. You're able to, you know, the MIAA, if you look, all the tournament, once you get into the, the finals and such, they're always going to be able to stadiums that have artificial turf so that everybody's on the level playing field. So we're now, we're now able to charge a fee to MIAA or any other group that wants to use that field. We put it into a revolving fund. Artificial turf is going to last you 10, 12, 14 years. So by the time it comes to redo that field, there is hopefully a significant chunk of money available to replace it. So those are my okay. basic thoughts on it. I mean, again, as I said, as somebody that sits up there and you know everybody talks about it, and if you have a no, bird's eye view, I got a bird's eye view, and, it, and and even not only me, but if you happen to watch the, uh, I, mean, I caught it the other day, the uh, soccer game. I think it was, I'm not sure if it was the boys or girls that they were playing after a basketball or something, and even the uh, 
the an ounce of half an innovation. In fact, you know, when you get between the twenties and you know between the twenty yard lines, it's 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 torn up. So thank you. So I mean, I think this has to be one of our highest priorities. I mean, we, we feel this is kind of an embarrassment right now, you know, and uh, we need to do something about it. And you know, what I like the students' <coughs> idea. That means it's an embarrassment for another couple more years, and I and I think it's about time. I think it's time we did it. And so my preference would be to put it all in. Um, we do significant <coughs> amounts of capital in the town every year, and we've been lucky that. We've been supported, but you know, other other departments have as well. You know, I mean, DPW gets a significant amount of capital funding every year. Other town departments, and so uh, to Mr. Dark's point, this is not just a school thing. When you go to the football games, it's not just you know parents that are there. There's people from all over the community, and there are other organizations using it. So I, I you know, I think we need to remind people of that. That while it's a school capital request is really something that we all own and it needs to be a high priority Thank for me. So I think that being said, Mr. Kiley, I think I would say we're all in agreement that that should be, you know, based on once you get the uh, CIP together, mm -hmm. um, that, that should be our top priority. Thank you. Thank you. You want to talk so about less efficient? Right, so this will be a quick one, hopefully. Um, so, fuel efficient vehicle policy has been in place in town for a while. Um, we have bought vehicles since it was originally in place. Um, it doesn't apply to school buses. It doesn't apply to the vehicles that we um, use to plow snow with. It doesn't apply, hasn't applied to um, special ed than transportation uh, because there's been no commercially available, available products that have met those requirements. So the short of it is it doesn't really apply to us um, under the current circumstance. <laughs> now that could change and there could and there may be vans let's say that would be available for, you know, for special ed use transportation that might meet those fuel For students who get money anytime in the near future. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. For right. So, um, so it could change, so it could eventually impact us. Right now it doesn't. And so we have no vehicles that... Okay. I, I guess I'm amazed that there are no low mileage school buses. That, uh, obviously school buses by their nature are not going to be tremendously low mileage, but one would think that that's something somebody should know. It, it actually is um, based on the gross vehicle weight of, of so there's a specific in the policy, there's a gross vehicle weight, school buses are way more than the vehicle weight, so they, they would be out right away. Just like the big BMW trucks out, are out right away. Our trucks um, that we use for our maintenance guys, which we plow all our snow with, need to be pretty heavy duty to get piece. done what, yeah, what we need, so, so you can't. You can't have electric. BMW you know, doesn't electric make electric uh, snow plow <laughs> trucks. For us. That's not going to apply. So it really doesn't apply to us, but um, I, I don't no objection to the <laughs> Thank you for your uh, update, Mr. Kiley. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gifford. Okay, just quickly, um, as you probably know, we several of us attended the mask mask conference last week. Um, I just want to give a shout out to our middle school team, um, Mr. Darren Doan and Richard Blair and Susan Tolson, who uh, part uh, participated by presenting on PBIS at our middle school. So we did a collaborative presentation um, with uh, Melrose. Melrose, thank you. We um, did the elementary version of what PBIS would look like, and uh, the middle school did the middle school presentation. So that was well attended, and it was really nice to see them there. Um, other than that, uh, the conference had another theme of, once again, social-emotional, building blocks of learning, and the urgency to include social-emotional embedded into the curriculum, not just as an add-on. So I think we're on the right track with that. You know, we really embrace that in our district. Um, the elementary teachers, I just want to give another shout-out to Tracy, who's doing tremendous work. 
across the board, many, many, many teams, literacy teams, math coaches, uh, elementary teams, the CIA team that we started last year, the one that was curriculum instruction assessment, has continued their work this year. And we talked about it today. Um, the work they're doing to develop units of study, align curriculum across our elementary schools, I think is really, really, really doing, they're doing a fantastic job. And again, the Tracy on the this um, supervision, but the teachers are just all enthused. They, the science units they're developing, so I can't say enough about that. So they had another painting last week working with Lucy Calkins' model, uh, conferencing and strategies, best strategies in the classroom. Um, we had Unity Day in all the elementary schools. It's been crazy and unity and unifying and all that good stuff. People would dress very strangely, but that's okay. Um, and I also wanted to talk about quickly, uh, and I'm going to let Mr. News talk about the BN program, but our uh, athletics, as you know, have been tremendous. We did just get a text that the volleyball team lost. Um, so I hate to break that news, but they said it was a full house and we were well represented in this fantastic team. Um, but other than that, just, you know, our boys soccer qualified for the state tournament. Um, the uh, cross country, we're, we're uh, old colony champs. The girls cross country, we had several runners participate in South Section. Field hockey didn't qualify for the state tournament this year, but had a great season. As you know, football did a great job, and we just uh, lost this past Friday. Uh, girls soccer qualified for the state tournament, and golf qualified for the state tournament. And of course, as we know, volleyball did, and then did lose tonight. So, you know, we've got some good academic stuff happening, band stuff, athletic stuff. You see the art program is taking off and moving, so just a lot of good stuff happening. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. You're welcome. Board of the Chair, just a couple of things. I just see you're out of the corner of my eye. A big shout out to Kathleen Amaral and her uh, counterpart that's not here this evening for the community resource fair that I think was very well attended and uh, bigger than ever this year. So uh, I think it went extremely well and I heard a lot of nice things about it. So always looking forward to the following year. Thank you and uh, thank you. Sounds for all your help. Um, on another note, uh, I don't know if you, any of you caught the Standard Times yesterday, but there was a very nice article about the Gidley School in it by Susan Pollitt Seaman. Uh, I thought that was very well written. And um, just a little side note off of that, I was um, I received an email as well with the um, select board and some of the other town officials from a former uh, school department administrator asking if there was going to be any kind of you know, closing ceremony or some something something commemorating the Gidley School before it does get demolished. Uh, we could, and she based that on the fact that it was kind of abruptly closed uh, with no bombing circumstance and it was just the doors were kind of shut shut down and that was that. So um, I'm going to reach out to the select board, um, Mr. Cressman, because I know Mr. Cressman was also included in the email to see if we maybe do, even though it isn't under our jurisdiction anymore. Um, but, you know, I'll offer any support that I can from the school department and maybe um, attend a little ceremony. And one of the other things that we were talking about that got brought up was the idea of, um, this is actually um, Chris McDonald that brought it up, sell, selling the bricks from Gidley School and having the proceeds go to the Adaptive Education Foundation. I have heard since from the police building committee that we might want to check whether those Bricks are safe to distribute. <laughs> Before we do that, because we may lose money in the lawsuits that happen after we distribute them, so, so we well, need all of our investigation. You may want to have it checked. <laughs> yes. uh, but, but nonetheless, um, I think it's something that I'll look into and see if we have something happen before February. I, I, uh, I think there are also some memorial things that are still on the property of the school that we should probably take a look at and respectfully preserve, transport, renew, somehow. Right. Something, you know. I would personally, Mr. Kyle, I would love to get a tour um, of the grounds. I'd be happy to. In the, in the, in the, in the, in the, I don't yeah, I, you provide respirators and plans for you? I, you know, I've been in there many times okay. and had no issues. All right. yes. But just to see what's on the grounds and all that. Yeah, just, sure. Yeah, I, I've not heard that, right yet, whether the dedication stones that are around there. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of condition they're in, but I think that's something we want to be able to answer before 
my, my understanding from the select board is February is a loose time that is coming down, not a hard time. Okay. So other than that, uh, continuing on our theme that uh, our central office has started this year about You Matter, uh, I have You Matter t-shirts for all of the school committee members. Oh. Dr. Jenkins. The sign is not right. Take it up with Joan. <laughs> 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 Mr. Garr. Take it up with Joan. Yeah, she figured it. And Mr. Hughes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very thank much. You. She can replace it. Nice. You matter. Yeah, very nice gesture. So yeah. Thank you to yeah. the central office for providing those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Nunes for his uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. music department update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since we last met uh, back on the uh, 28th of uh, October, the band went down to uh, Connecticut for the U.S. band, uh, New England finals and uh, we walked out of there with a 96.0 we had the high school for the night so we had the uh, New England champions and Massachusetts State champions in Division 5 uh, the following day we went up to uh, Medford in Lorraine to uh, compete in the uh, Nesma championships for Division 5 in the Scholastic Band Association and we walked out of there with a 98.9 and such. Uh, last Saturday, by about a long day, we went down to Bridgeport, Connecticut for the uh, U.S. Pans Regional Championships. Uh, we had to do the preliminaries in the afternoon and then go back to hang around and do the finals at night type of deal. Uh, in the preliminaries, we took first place in Division 5. We ended up with uh, best color guide, best music, best percussion, and then went back at night and took first place overall. Uh, our score in the afternoon was uh, 97.113. And then we went back at night and we got a 97.313 for first place overall, just the way the rotation with everyone did with 14 bands. We ended up with uh, best overall effect, best percussion, and best visuals. So it's been a, a great season. Uh, as Stacy mentioned, we're headed to uh, MetLife Stadium. Uh, Saturday for uh, U.S. Band's National Championships and uh, hopefully the uh, young men and women will be able to uh, continue the good season that they've had. Thank you, Mr. Newman. I promise not to text anybody until Sunday morning because our watch right now is scheduled somewhere around midnight if it runs on time. So. Yes, Mr. Newman. No, I'm not so quite a happy note. I would like to implore the people who are watching this we were reminded in the last couple of weeks that the students in the town of all different ages uh, are moving uh, from place to place to our school. I know that uh, it is getting darker in the afternoons now. I know there are a lot of people and there is a lot of construction out there. Let's slow down. The extra minute that you save getting to work or getting from place to place is not worth it and suffering that the family goes through. Frankly, it's not even worth the fear that the young child has to go through when they have to stand up in front of the school bus or waiting for the school bus and they see uh, a tractor truck come out of your neighborhood and bottom of your SUV right in front Slow down. Thank you for that. All the toast, man. <laughs> Anything else? Our next regularly scheduled meeting is actually a joint meeting with the uh, select board and the FinCon on November 14th, 2016. This time I'll entertain a motion to adjourn into the executive session for the purposes with respect to collective bargaining with union personnel not to reconvene. So we'll move Second. Motion by Mr. Newton, second by Dr. Jenkins on the motion. Any discussion? Chair Young, roll call. Yes. 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 Yes.